Welcome everyone once again to our female entrepreneurs worldwide hashtag as few anything online mentoring sessions and for those who have joined with us before or it's your first time just a reminder these sessions are to get experts in different fields together with our members and then get direct mentorship so we want these sessions to be interactive remember that you can type in the questions in the chat box or raise your hand make a movement so you can ask the question directly to our speaker my name is Jamilet Kana and I'm the founder of Louder. I'll be your host today once again. Thank you for being here and connecting. And today's theme, it's a little bit different from what we have had in the past on marketing and growth, but still we're gonna be talking about how to build and expand community and create a successful social enterprise in the environmental space with our speaker today, Roland Sharman. He is the founder of HK Outsider. This is an outdoors community where they do many, many different outdoor activities, but I'm going to let him talk more about what they do and what is the sense of community that they have. So without further ado, I want to welcome on this online stage, Roland. Hi, how are you? Nice to have you today. I'm great, Yamlet. How are you? Great, great. Thank you, too. On a Wednesday afternoon for lunchtime, it's great to have new insights and learnings on the perspective of how to run a social enterprise. So to start, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? I know you've been in Hong Kong for a long time. You have explored the outdoors of Hong Kong for many, many years. So how did you start with HK Outsider? It's interesting, actually. Everyone knows well, after a short while, they certainly know that I've been in Hong Kong for 46 years now um and i think a lot of people that come into the community they deem that oh wow he's been everywhere he's explored every corner of hong kong but in reality hk outsider itself has only been going for four for i guess four four years now mm -hmm. um and um i've been pushing the boundaries and outdoors for myself my personal uh goals uh maybe for seven years um listen hong kong outsider you know, I have a finance background. I grew up in Hong Kong. This is my home. I love the environment. I've always loved uh, hiking. Um, but, you know, in finance in Hong Kong, it's very intense, as we all know. And I went through a process, like a lot of people do, in facing personal challenges. And for me, um, I realized that I needed to somehow change my behavior and mindset. Um, and one of the key things I've always wanted to do in the outdoors, but never could get myself over that boundary was a, a, a very clear fear of heights, um, serious fear of heights. And as a lot of people know that suffer from this, mm -hmm. it only gets worse as you get older. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm in, this, I'm in this dark place. I needed to empower myself. So I, 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 I came to the realization that I needed to push myself into a vulnerable arena in order to accomplish um, other goals and, and find a new path for myself. I always like to say, hashtag find, find your own path. And this was one of the clear things. I needed to change behavior and mindset. Um, I, I needed to uh, find a new way forward and challenging myself uh, to, to scaling walls in a converted squash court in Kowloon with people I didn't know um, was challenging. Um, but overall empowering and transformational and that started my process into learning more about what hong kong had to offer in extreme sports like canyoning uh rock climbing is kind of popular now it's well regarded overseas it has a big community in hong kong canyoning not so much and canyoning involves entering in the canyons in a gorge or ravine where there's a water course and following mm -hmm. that water course down so sometimes it's just down climbing Sometimes it's abseiling or rappelling uh, for the Americans. Everyone else in the world calls it abseiling. And um, so you're abseiling over waterfalls and doing big cliff jumps. They could be two meters high. They could be 15, 20 meters high, which oh. is a significant feat. Um, so all sorts of challenges that involved vertical environments. Um, and, um, you know, it started organically. I started taking friends um, and showing them what I discovered through people showing me and my own self-exploration. 
um, challenging them in these, these outdoor environments, it gave them the same transformational experience. And really that's how Hong Kong Outsider started. How did you decide to focus your energy? You were saying that you dis you wanted to break bad habits, good or bad habits, in mm -hmm. order to create a new path. Mm -hmm. But when you say, okay, I'm going to focus on the outdoors and put all my energy there, and perhaps start to reach out with, to my friends and invite them to come with me. Is this the way that it all started? You were just a few friends, a group of friends going out and enjoying the outdoors, or you really had this idea of thinking, you know, I've been, I grew up in Hong Kong and most people have not seen this part of Hong Kong and I want them to experience this. Yes, that's, that, that's very much part of it. For me, it's, it's about showing people the alternative, alternative Hong Kong. Um, it, it, the, the, the nature here is phenomenal and, and everyone knows there's hiking in Hong Kong, but you know, just behind the scenes off the beaten trail, um, there is so much, there's so much more on offer. It did start with taking friends out, friends that also needed maybe perhaps a new, di new direction in life. Um, and I always love taking photos. I'm not a professional photographer in any way, but I love taking photos. Mm -hmm. I know how, I know the basic skills in taking photos. I've always had various cameras over the years and I've practiced um, and I edit uh, as well using proper editing suites. Um, so you can create some good content. And I, as just a, as a fun thing, I started an Instagram account as an older person, you know, five or six years ago when Instagram was all about, I mean, Instagram has been a buzz for a long time, but uh, I remember going into it, but I knew I needed to do something different. Again, this was part of my process. I'm not going to stick a photo up on Facebook. I have my, issues with Facebook and what that's all about, even though my account is still live. Um, but Instagram was different. It was just a picture. It's just a little message. It doesn't have to be very commercial. It doesn't have to, you know, show all your sort of opinions about the world. It's just, hey, look at this. This is a great picture of Hong Kong. So I started this Instagram account. <clears throat> and a lot of following came from that because, oh, wow, this is Hong Kong. Because I wanted to try and showcase Hong Kong in a different perspective showing the outdoor um, side of it, showing people engaging in the outdoor and, and what it had to offer. And the people I remember 10 years ago, everyone was saying, where are the waterfalls in Hong Kong? Oh my goodness, I've got so many waterfall places now, I, I don't even know what to do with myself. Um, we love those things. And I think, you know, maybe since COVID in Hong Kong, um, everyone's exploring Hong Kong a lot more. Obviously our community has expanded uh, in line with that as well. Um, but people are now discovering that, wow, Hong Kong is the place to be, certainly from an outdoor perspective. I, I want to ask you two questions here because you're talking yeah. about the power of social media in building community. Would you yeah. say that it's very important when we want to build community, this, different from creating a, a product that we want to build a brand based on a product, you have a service. So is social media very important for you to build this community? And would you say so for other entrepreneurs that think, okay, I wanna create groups like this one, the female entrepreneurs worldwide is also a community. And I know they're very, very active on their social media. So would you say that social media has become a very powerful tool for yourself? And then the second thing would be about COVID. You mentioned that COVID has changed a little bit the idea of people about Hong Kong. Has your business grown even more because of this situation? Wow, that's a lot of questions and things to remember, Yamalet. Thank you. Social um, media first. Social media, I think we all know the answer to that. It's absolutely essential. If you want to sit, you listen, we're all salespeople, no matter what background we come from. If you've got a positive message to sell, or even a negative one for that matter, as far as I'm concerned, it's all about affecting positive change for people. You need to share that message. You need to sell that message. And that is a medium that has become standard in today's world in terms of communicating, whether you're selling a product, where you're selling a mission, you're selling your community, um, your passion, your goals, your ideals, uh, and your values. You have to be in social media. I don't care to overly opinionized my commentary. I, I put little, little comments, I might title it if it looks like something interesting. Every now and again, like my recent post, which actually got a, quite a lot of likes actually with a big helicopter in the foreground, but it was really unique to see this amazing machine coming down to help someone stranded. And I was literally right there. If you wanna mm -hmm. have a look at it, it's an amazing photo. But the message is, it was for me, it was clear. You know, the, the guy was struggling with heat exhaustion. 
uh, someone died this Sunday in Hong Kong, unfortunately. You know, heat exhaustion and dehydration is a massive issue and people take it for granted. People don't know how much they're sweating. Um, they might feel it, but they're not consuming enough and they're not preparing in advance. So that was a message I wanted to get out to, to, to help people look after themselves. Um, because more and more people are taken to the outdoors because of the environment, which we'll touch on another question, because of this. And maybe they're not so experienced. And unfortunately, that's ha this has led to some uh, fatalities and injuries, an increase in fatalities and injuries in Hong Kong. I mean, that helicopter, I've, I found out it's been 1,200 times. Oh, maybe wow. 60 of those are for fires, but everything else is, you know, emergency related uh, a call outs, which is a lot, you know. Um, <clears throat> So would so, you say that, uh, sorry, Warren, would you say that social media, it's also helping you, it's one of the steps that you need to consider in order to build your community, but yeah. to, to, to tell people what they need to know, it's just also to educate them, not only to showcase yes. a pretty photo. Well, the other side of that very particular post was, yeah, this is, the you know, dehydration is a real thing. And the second thing is climate change and the climate crisis is real people. We need to affect change. So yes. It is all about sending your message of education because this is what we're all about. If you care for the environment, if you care for yourselves, mental illness, overall well-being, you have to communicate uh, and you have to share that message otherwise and lead by example. If, if I'm not communicating via social media, I'm not doing my job. Okay. What about then, as I said, has COVID changed the landscape of your business in, in this past few years where people really wanted to go out more so than before? Is it a trend or do you think it's going to continue this way? It's a little bit unique. For firstly, I wouldn't consider my, ourselves as a business. I like to say it's a community because money is certainly not my primary goal. Um, um, but yes, obviously it, the community has expanded greatly with the restriction on travel, people looking to keep themselves busy uh, for us, part of the time we had locked down, we couldn't do things as well because of the, 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 the amount of people that are allowed out together. But when things started opening up, we could do some smaller group activities again. Um, yes, it certainly increased because of that. But, you know, I think over the last couple of years, it was already sort of we were gaining momentum anyway uh, through people coming into the community. Our community is so broad. We have people from government workers to university students from all over the world. Uh, studying in Hong Kong to socialites to actors to you name it we have it I mean it's just amazing getting all these people together and that's what we're all about we're all about bringing individuals together we don't need to bring tribes of people together that are confident with each other we want to bring individuals together and help them uh, find a different path themselves help them improve their well-being uh, in, in an adventure environment um, now I've gone off on a tangent, Yamalet. Yeah, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> has, COVID, has COVID helped uh, expanding your business? Because people, so as you were saying, what? Yeah, yeah. so it, okay. very, it very much has. But I think uh, the word has been on the street about our community for a while. People have a, seen, yeah, some people come for the Instagram shot with the cool background of the city. We do night hikes, which is quite uh, unique. And all my hikes are not just walking along trails, they're um, they involve scrambling, which is a basic form of climbing. So you're using your hands as well as your legs. We're not walking upstairs. So I like people taking people off piece to give them a real, give them a real challenge. And adventure is different for everybody. Um, so there was already a movement, people coming for the Instagram shots, seeing the Instagram grow, uh, people understanding the benefits and the physical, the physical fitness side of it. And actually a lot of people want to come and meet people. Okay. Um, it's all about meeting different people a lot of people that are new to hong kong believe it or not a lot of people have come to hong kong in this crazy time it always surprises me um you know so there's there was already growing on that side but yes covid gave them a, gave it certainly an adrenaline shot uh, you know in the arm i guess it sounds like with community you have to take advantage of the opportunities you were growing already you had a certain amount of followers but with this new situation you didn't just stay there and wait okay when are things are going to reopen you just adapt your business and continue you're always, educating you're always people adapting, yeah. yeah yeah you're always, you're always adapting yeah. what are a few of the challenges that you have faced in this journey building up your community can do you have any experiences that you want to share with us <laughs> um, ch the, cha <laughs> the challenge is always finding someone as passionate as you are 
mm. who has the same mindset and the same goals to help you on this journey. Um, we have now, I think, about 700 people uh, in the community. Not everyone's active, but you still have to engage. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think it is, the idea for us is to bring people that come into the community, they spend, they don't just come for one experience, they come and that's the idea. We wanna bring you and take you on a different journey through all the adventurous pursuits you can, you can do. And actually there's a lot of commonality across them. So if you come out canyoning with us, you're gonna have experience for co-steering, and if you do our hikes, we're just scrambling hikes, a lot of climbing, rock climbing, obviously the same. It's just a question of how we approach the safety angle and how we're protecting people. But mm -hmm. very, the skill sets uh, and the skills you learn, are, you know, are, are common across across everything. Um, now, I've gone off on a tangent again. I'm terrible, aren't I? challenges challenges because we all know as entrepreneurs yep. as you were saying you you want to find you want to build a team that is as passionate as we are when we yep. start our businesses and yep. most of the time it's not the reality so how how do you manage that challenge yep. so thank you for bringing me back on track so because we have all these people coming through the community and learning these skills they ultimately we have this sort of guiding program and once you come a few times, you actually kind of want to do more. And then you want to start helping other people as well. You come on these, um, you know, for people that come the first couple of times, it's it feels a lot less like physical exercise and more like, uh, you know, an enhanced sense of achievement um, mm. and self-worth with the fitness and the improvement of overall well-being at the same time. I always talk about well-being. For me, it really is because that's where it started for me. It was the way I, about my mental illness. It was about overcoming um, my, my personal boundaries. Um, but as they come through this, they feel empowered and they want to share that. Of course they want to share that. So then we create a group of site, what we call trainee guides and they come through um, and they work their way up and they become leaders in the group as well and guide their own, guide their own, um, guide their own hikes or, or, or climbing days or what have you. Um, so the biggest challenge is keeping up with the growth. COVID is really blown up and we've got yeah. people coming in like 50, a hundred a week, uh, in, in some, in, in through, so through sometimes it's eased off a bit now as the towns come back to normality and people can go out again. Uh, so people are not waking up so early to go out adventuring with me at 6am in the morning. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, that is the biggest challenge coping with the scale. And, but that's how we do it. We're, we're naturally positioned to, if we're doing our job properly, educating people, bringing people into the community, they're learning and then themselves turning from mentees into mentors. And that is the process that we're quite proud of as well. So we're kind of self-sufficient, although coming to grips with technology and processes behind the scenes is also a challenge. And you, look, you have to seek out help for that. I never be scared to ask for help. You know, I'm a 50 year old person moving around in wicks and all these fancy sort of things. And it's 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 tough sometimes. But once you get it right again, it's it's empowering. It's, that's, it's for us to see that it doesn't matter the age. We can always start our own businesses, our own ideas or just follow whatever passion that we really, really believe in and change people's lives. You're talking about and I'm, I'm going to go around and, and circles with this point you're talking about the backstage and a lot of people and entrepreneurs we don't talk about the backstage we just want to showcase the fancy front front of the house uh, which yeah. would in your case perhaps would be the experience per se or the social media but what happens how do you juggle as sometimes as we become entrepreneurs but we can be solopreneurs and then we have this these people working with us and helping with us but not all the time full time so how do you juggle that backstage stress in that you want to keep up with the software changing or the new trends? You wake up one day with a thousand more followers. That's a dream of a lot of entrepreneurs or a lot of people, even in influencers in social media, right? We want to wake up and, oh my God, there's so many followers. You don't want to lose them. So my question would be, how do you juggle with all these many things that happen in the backstage? Do you have a routine or you just follow that passion? What happens in, in the day to day? Wow. Um, yes, you have to have a routine. Um, 
the, 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 you're right, the, the, the front end experience is generally quite good for people and it looks amazing and it looks all automated, but the back end is, is, far, is, is far from that. I think a, a lot of the problems that people have, and I, perhaps I fall into this bracket a little bit as well, is I'm reluctant to let go of save my baby. Um, and frankly, then it if you don't let go, it becomes overwhelming. It's impossible to keep up, um, and you, you you can't micromanage. You just you just have to surround yourself with people that are smart, that have the same moral compass and guidelines, uh, you know, and goals. But they're going to have their own personality, and you've got to understand that you've got to give you've got to give up. You've created something. Your 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 character and your goals and your ideals are all very much part of the community, which I know they are. Um, but it's going to evolve, like everything evolves, and you just have to let go and let the people help you. For so, for that simple question is, I ask for help. I need help with some of these things, and I work with them. I don't let go and just let people do it. I try and educate myself as well at the same time, because that's very important. You have to continually educate yourself. You have to continually train, uh, a ch change and, and, and change with the environment, et cetera. There's, there's, nothing you can, um, there's nothing you can achieve on your own. You can work hard, but again, it's about the people that support you. It's about engaging with them, finding that support within the community and that true community spirit. So yeah, you ask for help. That's completely true. As you were saying, if you're building a community, you cannot act as if you're not a community and, and try yeah, to yeah. solve everything yeah. by yourself. Yeah. You said in the beginning, people come to you because perhaps they want the Instagram shot or they're curious about knowing other places in Hong Kong. But then when they have the experience, they almost feel like a transformation and they open and they just go through battling those fears. Perhaps they don't know that jumping from a cliff 15 meters could feel so dreadful, but then when they experience it at the end of the day, they have such a wonderful taste. How, how is this helping people in their daily life? I think um, this is a very key element of what I'm trying to achieve. Um, <clears throat> I can talk simply about what I mentioned earlier about um, you know, some people come out for fitness. You know, for me, when I take people out, people say, well, you've done this hike 50, 50, 100 times. I say, yeah, but I like doing it for myself because I it's good for my fitness. Um, you've got to build a strong core of fitness as you as you grow older. So for me, I'm helping myself and I know someone else is going to get enjoyment and something positive out of it as well. Um, but you talk about an enhanced sense of achievement and well-being. I think this translates very well, well into everyday life because I don't want to say it's as drastic as a life and death experience because it's not. We protect, we're very focused on safety. We protect your lives. That's our primary, primary, primary goal, obviously, to have a safe experience. Um, um, but it's pretty damn close to a life or death experience. You know, you do something wrong or I do something wrong, or, you know, and I make people own their decisions. I make people, you know, I'm not like a, a proper tour agency or outfit like if you go traveling to New Zealand they will always have a safety line I you know that's not you know if you're doing an abseil that's not abseiling you need to own it you need to do your own abseil yes I'll protect you but I'll protect you in a different way okay. so yeah if you can and, and this is the challenge sometimes it's the height whether you're doing a big the two the two key things that people are most challenged with are abseiling which means going off the cliff on a rope and you have equipment, you have a harness, and we have what we call a descender. And the descender is a little piece of metal this big attached to your harness. So it's a question of, do I trust the equipment? Mm. Um, this is a scary environment for me. Or if you're just jumping into a, a, a rock pool of water or off a cliff into the ocean, it's, um, it's, it's that fear of heights. And now, wow, do I trust myself? Can I, you know, what, what can I do? better but effective there isn't so when you go through this experience the the elation of challenge yourself you know and that's just you know this this is where as a leader you've got to be wear many hats actually you've got to be the technical instructor you've got to be the friend and you've got to be the psychologist as well and try and help them 
make their decision. You can't just tell them to jump, go one, two, three, and just go. You need to help them through the decision process themselves. But once they commit, and I always know before they, we even start this situation, I've stood with many people at the top of the rock, you know, for 15, 20 minutes discussing the various issues with them. And I always know within the first 10 seconds whether I'm going to be there for 20 minutes or, or whether they're going to jump, because you can feel it, because it's all in their head. It's all the mental aspect of everything. And that's what you're going to try and help manage it. You don't have to be the most physically fit to come out with us. You certainly don't have to be have the right physique. Um, it's all about the mental attitude. You don't have to have the ability that will help you and train you with that. Um, so, um, damn it, I've done it again. Get me back on track, please, Yamale. How can they use that in their daily life? If I'm yeah. a, a corporate worker, yeah. like, how is this going to help me? Yeah. So to go through all this process, the mentoring, the, the, the lessons that, you know, and then do the feet, do the big jump or abseil off the, it's the most natural high and elation you, you could possibly feel. And to do that with people that actually can be strangers. We do have some friends coming along, but as I said, we bring individuals together. Do it with strangers that have a shared goal in trying to complete the the course or the hike or the canyoning experience or whatever it is, it is totally empowering. And it makes it, I think it belittles maybe, I don't know what everyone's day-to-day -day job is, but if you're working in an office and you've got a, a boss that's a bit of a, an ass, you know, I think you're gonna be less worried about that when you know you've taken complete control of your life, you've owned it. Um, and you've got that sense of accomplishment there. It's incredibly empowering to go through that process. And I think you really become one with yourself. You're living in the moment, you're doing this adrenaline fueled activity. Um, then you come back to work and it all seems a bit, yeah, whatever. That's the <laughs> feedback I've been getting from people anyway. And I get it, I, you know, I hate public speaking. Well, I used to anyway, now I'm out there doing briefings with hundreds of people all the time. I'm not bothered. You know, I know I'm doing good. So that's all we have to all we have to be thinking about. And for other people, you know, if they feel empowered because of that, that's great. It feels, yeah, that when you, when we want, if anyone wants to go into the social enterprise arena, it feels like that community has to be giving and and taking at the same time you are giving these people the empowerment the trust that they need to build in order to take control of their lives but they're also giving you those moments where you can develop yourself you grow as a leader and you're learning on how to read people how to react to them depending on the situation correct yeah correct and that takes Absolutely me to correct. my that takes yeah. me to my second question which would be how do you choose these leaders? What is your philosophy when it, it comes to choosing your teammates? Because I don't feel that they only have to be technicals or experts in balleting someone or hiking techniques. They have to be more, more than that. What's that yes. philosophy yeah. that you take? As, as I said uh, briefly in the, in the last question, we have to wear multiple hats. We have to be the leader, which is the technical instructor understand the technical aspects of what we're doing and the safety aspects associated with what we're doing you have to be the friend sometimes you have to be the enemy as well to get them going a bit but that's just bravado and fun and you can feel that and people understand that but sometimes people need a little push and there's nothing wrong with that um i've been called the drill sergeant more than once or twice i have to say um and, and then you have to be the psychologist um and you, or you have to be the supportive friend, you know. You, so to, for me to find that it's it's difficult, and then you have to have someone aligned with the, your passion. Um, it's it's difficult, um, but these are the things that I look for when 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 I have people coming through. It's really for me. It's not necessarily about the technical prowess. Mm -hmm. If he's the best abseiler or instructor or whatever field he comes from, our leadership group currently has people from all facets of life they can't all maybe guide a canyoning uh, activity because of the canyoning activity like rock climbing is very technical lots of ropes lots of skills lots of safety procedures you know you need a lot of experience for that but it doesn't mean they can't be a leader in other aspects a, a contributing to the community and wherever their skill set lies whether it be social media for instance um, some will can lead other hikes but they all have to have the sort of same 
connection that I do. They want to they want to teach people. They want to be passionate about helping people achieve for themselves because as they have as they've come through the community, and it's that sense of helping others which is key more than anything else. You know, for me, this is not about being an adventure company. It's about being a company to help people. Um, bring people together to help themselves and um, improve well-being. You know, as I said, I could be an adventure rock climbing company and take 50 people out. Just does, that won't do anything for me at all. Have I gone off tangent again? No, I think I'm okay. No, that was perfect. To be, to be <laughs> an entrepreneur in the, in the social enterprise, again, as I said, industry or, or arena, you need to have strong soft skills and also be very empathetic. I, yes. I do have to say, I, I try to jump the first time I went out with you guys. Uh, you made me jump from this 10 meter or six meter. It, it looked very, very high. And seven meters, I believe. It seven was. meters. And you, you knew what to say. I wasn't having it. I was hesitating. And then you just said to me, because I guess my personality of my ballerina background, you said, you don't have to do it. That's okay. And that's the thing that pushed me. Mm -hmm. Not the yeah. encouragement, but yeah. more the, yeah, you can do it. It was more like, that's okay. You don't have to do it. So you're yeah, knowing how to treat people and talking Everyone to is them. different. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone is different. And you need to find that. And it's actually quite easy to find. If you're an empathetic, empathic, empathic. person, empathic, empathetic, how do you pronounce it? I guess it's empath or empathetic. Yeah. Empathetic. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have to be that kind of person. You have to be a giver. Mm. Um, you, you know, it's for, for me, as I said, you, you have to be kind, you have to give, you want to You inherently my whole life, I've wanted to help people, or rather, I've wanted to please people because it makes me happy. Um, so I'm always wanting to do things for people, whether they need that particular thing or that particular help or to tell them how amazing they are or not. But I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to feel useful. I think is the, is the right thing. So, and there's people that are like that. There's people that want to help people. And we also know there's takers in this world and there's people that just don't care about anybody except themselves. There's no room for people like that in my community, I can tell you. And this is part of, you know, if it's not, the value is not aligned with me, you're, you're not welcome. And I don't care, your money is no good. Um, so you, that's, that's what it's all about. It makes me, it reminds me of a conversation we had a few months ago with Carol Logan Berlin, and she was talking about fundraising. And because it also has to do with asking about giving and having that, that balance between the, the passion that you have and what you want to get uh, out of people and what you want people to get out of the experience. What would be your three recommendations or if you have one or two any recommendation that you may have for our entrepreneurs that want to be focused in the social enterprise world or in the environment world that create creating a community you said you have to be a giver you said to you have to build you have a to team. have a passion you have to be kind yeah for sure um i think you you need to have a clear goal of what okay. you want to achieve with it without question and the goal you know it's like okay how am i going to come up with an idea for a social enterprise or some sort of entrepreneurial goal you know you can't measure it in terms of monetary value or success personally um i think you need to try and have a goal that's associated with affecting positive change in the mission that you're working towards um that is key you have to have the passion with anything as an entrepreneur in any space or whatever you have to be passionate about it. You don't do it, you know, because it's a hell of a lot of work, I can tell you that. Um, and I've generally been quite a lazy person my entire life. And I've, I shouldn't really be saying this online, but I've kind of coasted through in finance and done, been very successful. And then I've had challenges personally, which has affected that. Um, but I've been generally kind of a lazy person. But once I came into this arena and I started doing this, again, it comes back to my, you know, when I was younger, I've always wanted to please people. Oh, look at this cool thing I've just found mm -hmm. and how it makes me feel and how positive it is. And it's given me the courage to improve my life. Um, you know, that is, you know, that's, that, that's, you know, that's what, I, that's, it's gotta be all about that. It's gotta be all about affecting that positive change and having that goal. Um, and I think you have to lead by example. Okay. You have to lead by example, talk the talk, walk the walk, and that's how you inspire change. I think no, those, I mean, I, you don't have I the guess, passion. 
<laughs> yeah, without the passion, you're not going to do the work. And trust me, there's a lot of work. Yeah. How can you make it sustainable? How can you ensure that with the growth that you're having, it's still going to be sustainable? Is it because you are creating a very good team or is there any other things that you must do? To I think we're, we're in a unique position, the way we're structured um, to Really, it was self-sustaining in a way because people are joining the community, then more people are moving up and wanting to help. Some people want to be passive and just enjoy the experience. But a lot of people actually, you know, they want to be asked to do more. They or they come to you and say, you know, can I help out? And you said, yeah, well, this is the guiding program. We'll give you this and we'll teach you more of the technical aspects. Um, and this is what I'm working. I want to work more around the well-being and melted mental melting mental illness aspects of it all. Um, but you know, for us, it's very, so for us, as the community grows, we should have more guides. We should have more passion. We should have more aligned, uh, visions within our leadership group and it works very well for us, but handling growth is, is always a problem, but that leads back to one of our early questions. You, you just need to ask for help. And I think help, you, you can look internally for advice. Um, I think that's very empowering for people in your leadership team to feel part of the process. I don't think that's anything new in terms of business strategy or, or what have you. Um, you want to empower them. You might not listen to them, but you're going to ask them. But it's all about being part of the process and including them in part of the process. And you need to look externally, maybe to a mentor, maybe to someone that you trust uh, that doesn't have maybe the unique insight into what you're doing that can give you a different perspective because you, you definitely need some kind of 360 view on what you're doing um i'm always asking people what they think whether it's about is this too much or is this too much money or is this an appropriate activity look at the safety standards you've got to question yourself you test yourself we, we say in canyoning which is my primary passion uh, in terms of activity that it is an incredibly dangerous environment where, where we go and it's much more dangerous than rock climbing or depending on the arena of course but the environment is generally much more hazardous than anything else. And, and um, you know what, I've done it again. Can you remind me where I was? You ask people. I love going off on these tangents. Uh, <laughs> you, you ask people uh, their advice when you're in these situations in order to sustain your business and your community. Yeah, I'm sure, not quite sure what I was trying to get to when I was talking about the canyoning. Um, but it is a dangerous environment and no, I can't remember the story. I was going to come, come up with a little ditty for you, but I've, it's, it's escaped me. That's okay. Perhaps you, perhaps you were because of the, of the situation of the environment, you've gone to other people that have done it before and see what are the things that you should watch out for, because you were talking about opening perspective, you as the leader and the founder of your community, Perhaps we're always going through one liner of tunnel vision and asking for help and asking for people's feedback. That's what I got from you when you were saying that yeah. in order to make your community sustainable, you need to ask in and you also need to ask out. Yeah, ex externally, yeah. I just can't remember what, the, what I was trying to get to with the candidate story and being the dangerous environment. Um, but yes, you, you, you do go outside. I, I, I think for me, when you're in these environments, that you always have to, oh, that's what I was saying. Now I remembered the point of the story, hazardous environment. So what we have to do is double check, triple check, quadruple check. You're always checking. You're always checking, pushing the carabiner to make sure it's closed, checking the rope, looking for there, looking below. We don't just expect that it's done. Like when you're on the rope and climbing, you're kind of on the rope and you're okay. Not in this environment. So therefore, as per the activity, you've got to continually question what you're doing with the community. You've got to continually ask, continually check, continually ad ad assess where you are, what your goal is, are we on track? And that requires input from people externally and people internally. You're always almost like product testing. Is this working for you now? The community? We all, if we're not product testing every single day, um, and that's why I need to be freed up and bring more people in because I've got all these creative ideas and the creative ideas pile keeps going like this and I never get to it. But, and if I don't, then we're going to become stale. But any entrepreneur in any, any place will say, hey, 
you need to keep you need to keep evolving you need to keep innovating you need a new product i need to curate new experiences you you need to do this in a different way we need to change the onboarding process we need to look at really creating a solid foundation and how we can improve the well-being aspect and training for the people within the community there's all sorts of things that we can continue to do it's never ending yeah Juggling creativity versus reality and yeah. within budgets and time frames. Yeah. That's what us entrepreneurs have to do with it. And it sounds like in any environment, it doesn't matter if we are a product or service or in the in the community based mm -hmm. uh, services. Yeah. So your unique value proposition, the, the, the things that you give your community to experience are the are especially the things that have made you grow and also be connected to other communities and with other brands that also support your business. I know that you have had collaborations with Adventure Cleanup a few years back in some uh, beach cleanups and adventure cleanups. And this year you're working with EcoDrive and this, uh, Andy Cornish, the ambassador for, for the sharks and the rays. Um, with the WWF. So how, how do you create these collaborations and how useful are they for your own community? I think, again, it's aligning yourselves with individuals or companies or organizations with similar, with similar messaging, similar values, uh, et cetera. Um, the community is broad. You're going to bring people in. And again, you want to align yourself with these people. Adventure cleanup, I've been very passionate about the environment um, for many years. My friend Craig Leeson um, directed uh, and starred in a movie called A Plastic Ocean, which is on Netflix. And I, if you haven't seen it already, I'd be surprised. But if you're involved in the environmental space or are passionate about the environment, you should go and look at Plastic Oceans. I know the Sea Spiracy is the recent um, uh, movie that's come out. Um, I'm not going to comment about that. Uh, but Plastic Oceans really highlighted to many people at the time the issue of plastic pollution and waste in our environment and its impact on climate change. Um, so this was probably about 10 plus years ago now, and, and Craig's a very close friend of mine. So from then, I've always been passionate about trying to affect change in that. So meeting Esther um, and Sol, who are the founders of um, Adventure Cleanup, um, and they said, listen, we've got this first. And I actually went out with them and did a, a cleanup thing. And then they created this competition. And I said, that I'd love to be involved. Um, it's adventure, it's adventurous environments, it's cleanup. You know, for me, and I don't think anyone in this space will disagree, that cleanups are not the solution uh, for our world. Um, it's too late at that stage. But we use these because they're quite common and popular as a platform to educate people. Mm. So, and actually part of the process with adventure cleanup we had 10 teams of 10 um it went on for a month which was quite a long time i have to say but it wasn't just about how many bags of trash we can take out from our site it's about the the techniques employed and how you know clever you came up with solutions to your particular location and, and how to overcome those it was about community engagement i went with my partner uh, derek to one of the local schools and we got dressed up in our climbing gear and, and went in with our hats on and they all had a bit of a laugh, but you know what, you know, as part of the engagement of the community, but you know what, kids kind of get it. They've been born into this situation that we've created for them. It's adults, you know, people in I mean, teenagers and early twenties now get it. Thanks to, thanks to Greta and, and everyone else making positive commitments um, and trying to affect positive change through education in the world. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, um, it's fabulous. Um, but there we go again, I've got off tangent again. Can you bring me back? How are those important these collaborations with you yeah. for yeah. growing your yeah. own community? So yeah, so, do, yeah. so doing all, so doing all the, um, so, so doing all that was very, very positive part of it. So it wasn't just about doing the cleanup for adventure cleanup. It was about the, about the community engagement. Uh, it's about, I had to fill in a, a spreadsheet of information about what we've done. We turned up, we've cleaned about this many bags, we use these techniques, we all turned up with disposable with um, reusable water bladders to drink, you know, and, and, you know, 
again, walking the eco talk, not just you know, leading by example, not just uh, not just following. So for me, that was very easy. And they're, they're still going, and, I, and I'm always always on the side helping them. I haven't participated in any more com uh, in any more competitions, um, but because the community takes up a lot of my time now. Um, but always on the side, really ready to help those ladies anytime. I think um, they're doing a great job. Eco Drive is is a new thing. I can't really talk about much of that at the moment. There's a new campaign coming out very soon. But again, it all of it works uh, with Andy and everybody else that we collaborate with. It's all a question of aligning ourselves with positive people that will, that share our share our share our goals. And um, it's about education. For, for the environment, we need the, we need government action to ban single-use plastics without question. Technology is improving all the time, but recycling is not the solution. We need to stop buying this stuff. This stuff has to not go into our environment, not, it needs to not be bought. We all need to change our behavior, change our mindset, um, you know, in order to reach, you know, the goals that we all wish to get to. And in order to that is about education. So we use all these collaborations as a form of educating people, sharing that education through our community and other communities. And that's what it's all about. So I'll, all, I, you know, I'll do as much as I possibly can for these people uh, as it's a very much a shared, a shared message. Building strong community is all about collaborating and yeah. with other communities and using those platforms to educate, but also to share the information. As you were saying, it's wonderful that we know that the, the information is out there because a lot of people will think, well, you've done this thing, but if I wasn't there, how can I know more? You are cross sharing information through this collaborations in the community. That it is wonderful. What you are working mainly here in Hong Kong and obviously exploring the Hong Kong environment. But if you were to expand globally or anybody in the same industry that will think, okay, I have my brand here and I want to expand it globally. What would you have to think about if you were to go somewhere else? Is there any things that we need to watch out for? Perhaps the terrain or the branding itself? Is there any tips there? I think we're a little bit unique in this situation as to what we offer and what we're doing as a community. Hong Kong is incredibly unique um, as I've been here almost my life. Um, we have the local uh, geographic topography where we have a city surrounded by mountains. Mm. Um, we can get to the border with China in less than an hour, which basically means that all the activities we do and there's lots and many places to go uh, so much so that, uh, you know, I, even the ones I know right now, are, you know, it'll be five years before most people in the community get there because there's just too many. Um, and we're going too fast. Um, 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 so it's great because in Hong Kong, and this is what I like to do, because it's not just about taking a whole weekend to do something outdoors. It's about just taking three or four hours of your time. So we leave early in the morning. We can drive out or bus out or MTR out. The access is amazing with local transport and you can be pretty much anywhere within an hour um, doing incredible things. And then back again to socialize, to connect with each other again, which is very much what, what we do as well. And that's about a question of creating new bonds, creating new friendships. Um, and that's empowering too, for a lot of people that find it very hard to come out of their shell. Um, we have a lot of these people and, and I've heard reports back, even from other people about particular people in the community that they were very shy at first. And then they've come through with the friends in their group and the community and challenged themselves in this outdoor environment. And they have felt much more comfortable becoming more outgoing. I never even, I mean, I was a bit quiet at first, but then actually chatting away, I didn't even think anything of it. But for me, that's what we're all about. Um, so, so we meet up afterwards, we're always engaging, we've had relationships, we've had marriages, we've, had, we've even had babies of people in the community. So it's not just doing our outdoor, it's not just doing our outdoor um, activities, it's doing cleanup uh, um, commitments together, it's doing social um, gatherings, um, arranging, we did a snake safari with William Sargent uh, the other week, bringing people together to do, to do new unique things. Um, but all this is very unique for Hong Kong. We can do the three or four hours in the day, especially in this heat. That's that's plenty. 
uh, and then come back and have the rest of the day to ourselves or how we want to share it with other people or what you want to do. So I'm very lucky to have to have found this path for myself with the community and, and how I know it's helping people. But how does that translate to anywhere else in the world? Well, it, it, it's very difficult, in fact. Hong Kong is a tier one global financial city. There's no other tier one city where you can go in half an hour, be canyoning down a waterfall or rock climbing or doing, there's none of that. London, New York, you're traveling for three hours a day, even, or it's, you know, of course there's cities that have outdoors in their backyard, like maybe Toronto. I wouldn't consider that a tier one financial city, but we are very uniquely placed in, in Hong Kong. Um, so for me, my focus, as my focus is now, is not about the adventure, not about the activities, it's about the well-being. So for me, yes, I would love to expand globally, but I'd have to change the makeup. It will still be about bringing individuals together and challenging them in an outdoor environment, but the activities may be different. The timeline might be different, but you, I just have to adapt. But for me, it's really gonna be based more about more around the well-being aspect of the community uh, and bringing individuals together to, to challenge each other and, and improve. Um, and I'd, and, I'd have to, and I'd have to look at the, the various locations where it might work. I guess I would have to have a personal connection or, or I'd have to have people that I feel have the same values that can help me with the, ge the, the geographic situation. But yes, it's, it'll, it won't be canyoning, rock climbing and co-steering. It, it might be skiing, it might be mountaineering, um, but it will always be about the well-being and bringing individuals together. So the core of your community the passion stays there. It's just about the adaptability depending on the terrain and perhaps yep, what yep. that community in that space requires. Yep, yep. But yep. the core core will never change. Yep. You're still educating, making people feel confident mm -hmm. and having this good experience at the end yep. of all. I think, well, yeah, that's very much it. I think even now, once we have a more open environment, although really what we do is all about Hong Kong, HK Outsider, um, that we wouldn't i think now we have a platform there's no reason we can't adapt and do trips outside hong kong mm. taiwan for instance has amazing canyoning it's a whole different level it's like europe it's amazing and we would do trips outside so maybe that'll be a forerunner for me to look at doing longer trips when i find different locations that might work if we can bring that kind of community feel to the, to that area but you already have a strong community so it's more on the logistics not that not building that sentiment yeah before i open the floor to to our attendees i want to ask your last question what would be your last piece of advice for our entrepreneurs if they want to get into this space environmental space social entrepreneurship ngo anything that has to do with giving back to community what should they think about huh. i keep saying this it's you know you can't, if you want to be passionate about the environment and the outdoor space, that, that's fine. You, you, you have to have the passion. You can't think of where can I, and this is a big problem in the environmental space, the moment greenwashing and the monetary values associated with creating products or, you know, and, and things like that. I'm, I don't really want to add too much weight to that, but it's a problem. So your goal can't be, I want to be, you know, I want to make money. Or I want to do this. You know, you have to, you have to have an overarching view to ch affect positive change in, 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 in the world for yourself and for others. Um, listen, if it's about making changes or in any environmental space, just start small uh, and do things like that. That's more for a personal perspective. If you want to create a movement or a community or a business around it, you need to find your own path. I don't think you can actually create an idea. You maybe need to connect with people in the space, come out with us. Um, for us, the environmental protection and the adventuring goes hand in hand because we're, we're literally the most interactive group or if you're in the outdoor space you're the most interactive with seeing exactly what is going on because most people don't see 50 meters off the beach either side the beaches get cleaned by government or cleanups all the time 
50 meters around the coast, you've got three meters high of polystyrene lunch boxes, or actually not even lunch boxes, just the small pellets, which you can't clean away. No one sees that. So we have a very unique perspective of what damage is being done by the population in terms of environmental, in terms of environmental damage. Um, listen, I, you know, I'm not quite sure I'm giving you the answer you need, um, but number one is passion. You don't do it for a monetary goal or I want to be the best at or you want to be successful. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it's an, and it's aligned with the people that you look up to and then just get stuck in. I mean, you just have to meet people and experience it. Um, it's not difficult to help an environment. There's there's cleanups and this, that and the other. But, you know, don't think about the cleanups too much. It's about the education. Maybe yeah. educate yourself so you can educate others and walk the path. Lead by example is another one of my favorite sayings. Connect, be passionate and educate. One question from our floor, and I know oh someone dear. there in, in Thailand may have a little question for you, Roland. Hi, Rachel. Yes, yeah, she raised her hand. I leave it to you. Perfect. I kind of have a two part question. Um, so I'll ask the first part first. Uh, the first part was how did you find an issue that you wanted to create an impact in? Well, I think I just answered that 25 seconds ago. <laughs> um, well, firstly, I. Um, when I met my friend Craig and we were, when he was producing um, the movie, A Plastic Ocean, and I realized how much damage had been done. That was the question, right? What was the, what yes, was the question again? It, how did you find the issue? Yeah, 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 well, he made that issue very bloody clear. He, he, he was, uh, we've got a big floating garbage patch in the, in patch in the middle of, you know, the middle of the ocean. This is a serious problem and then the marine life and stuff i'm an avid diver as well so it's uh, but you know i haven't dived that i mean i used to dive lots in the 80s and 90s but in recent years not so much but it's still an issue and we're in the ocean all the time here but that's how it started but as i said when i said 25 seconds ago we are we are in the environment we see what's going on you cannot be standing on the sidelines. This is our playground. Every weekend we go out, it's our backyard, it's our playground, this is where we live. And listen, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure it's not all people. You, you see, listen, I've seen gas cans, I've seen dollhouses in the middle of a waterfall, you know, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, how the heck does that get there? Um, and it's not about maybe pe just people throwing trash. We, there's other issues like the bins get knocked over by wild boar and then the rains come and the monsoons and it washes it into the waterways because we're seeing in the waterways the ocean is obviously ocean trash um so this is the whole point about education we have to stop putting it in the system stop buying plastic bottled water stop buying straws if someone tries to give you a straw with a bottle of coke i love bottles of coke because they're recyclable and they taste so much better um, but everyone keeps trying to give you a straw. God, give me the straw. I don't need the straw. It's that perceived value of a straw. We don't need it. No one needs a straw unless you're having a cocktail and got all your makeup on, ladies. But then you can carry a steel straw for your own benefit. But um, so the issue started with my friend Craig Leeson and when, when he was putting together a plastic ocean. And then, you know, ever since I've been involved and it's just worse and worse and worse um, where we see the trash and the makeup of trash um, when we go on our hikes every single time every single time that's why i say in my little brief um it's the only thing i say but it's enough we are very anti-plastic bottles please bring a bladder or a usable bottle and um and often in the early days there'd be people huddling they're, they're way behind in the group and they're, they're sort of huddling around i go what's going on back there guys stacy's bought a plastic bottle she doesn't want you to see it and i laugh and everyone laughs but you know what the message was received and it doesn't matter that she's done it she understands it's wrong and that behavior will change and therefore she will change other people's behavior going forward just these little things that's why i'm always happy to go to the supermarket and juggle loads of stuff and people say you know what are you doing i said well i forgot my reusable bag and i certainly ain't going to take a plastic one i don't care if it costs 50 cents or 50 dollars so i'm juggling all the way back you've got to lead by example yeah for sure thank you that's so true and my, the second part is um, what has been the most rewarding and empowering um, thing for you developing this community so far? 
I don't think it's one thing. I think it's the little stories that come back about that gentleman I was saying who came out of his shell, about people struggling with personal identity, all the little stories about empowerment from being part of the community. Um, I'm not sure I can remember the first one, but because there's so many and that for me, they all add up and that's what it means to me. This is the whole reason I do it. If one person gets something out of it, then I feel I've done my job. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And I can't wait to get out with you guys at some point. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And it's true. I, I mean, I'm sure you can have a, a big book around all the stories that have happened in HK Outsider and all the adventures. Thank you once again, Roland, and obviously our few community for being here with us, connecting a little bit for the whole duration. It's been very, very empowering. And if you want to go out and experience these adventures with Roland, make sure to connect with him on his IG, HK Outsider or website, right, Roland? What's where, where they can find you? HKOutsider.com, HKOutsider, HKOutsider, any way you like, that's what we are. Adventure at HKOutsider.com is the email. You can find <laughs> us online. I'm sure, make sure you go, and it's getting hot, but there's so many activities water-based and yeah. experience Hong Kong. And if you're not in Hong Kong, whenever you are able to come here, please connect. Thank you. We have another wonderful session next week with Jody Chan. And if you can't connect, rewatch the replay. And I'll see you. Bye for now. Chat next week. Thank you. Bye.